write all the speeches and we'd stage the whole thing. So just about every element of his campaign. Okay. Allegations that those in the Jubilee administration are vehemently denying. Take a look at our super wall and this is a tweet from Dennis Itumbi. I'll read it for you. They say uh, the campaign for the presidency in 2013 started in February 2011. The credit for strategy formation of TNA and URP messaging communication and rebranding belongs to a group of young Kenyans. Um, you should have that on your screen any moment now to get that reaction. But let's speak to Nanjala Nyabola in just uh, a moment. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Let's just move on, please, um, because I've, I've read that tweet out. Um, let's speak to Nanjala Nyabola now. Um, you talk about the effect that the internet has on democracy. I mean, even if all of this were puffery, as some have said, and might have been them overstating to sell to a possible client, what do you think is the effect of internet in democracy in Kenya today, considering viral videos, fake news that goes around even on WhatsApp? I think to understand how the internet collides with politics in Kenya, you have to understand the, the lay of the land before that. Um, and that is the state of the traditional media, um, where people get their information from and what they're able to do with that information. So first of all, when you, think, when you look at the traditional media landscape, and especially if you look at around the election period, um, to be quite frank, Kenyans are starved of objective um, you know, clear-sighted political information that uh, that is, you know, giving them just the facts and not necessarily just not necessarily the spin. And what social media does, the connections between social media and traditional media in Kenya make certain lines of communication possible that are not happening in other African countries and are certainly not happening in countries like Europe. Um, there is a, a, a dynamic whereby a lot of information, and even right now, you know, on this show, we're reading out peep tweets on air, um, and I think that people are getting information from what's trending online, from the conversations that are happening online, which means that even though we don't have the largest number of people online in Africa, those people who are online are still able to have an outsized influence on the content that goes out on traditional media. 78% of Kenyan households own radios. The biggest purveyor of ethno-nationalist uh, or tribalist discourse during the election period, this is according to the NCIC, was the radio. But where were they getting this content from? It was those same memes and the viral videos and, and the conversations that were being had online that were being reproduced and replicated offline. That's the real impact that we're seeing in Kenya right now, which is the shift in the public discourse. It's who is getting information from where. Some of it is good, actually. I mean, we've seen much more representation of women um, and ethnic minorities because they're able to find space online that doesn't necessarily exist in traditional media. If I go online right now on my Twitter account, I will find so many women who are commenting and, and giving you know, powerful opinions on social and political issues. If I open a Sunday newspaper, I'll be lucky if I can find two. On any one week, it's usually just one. So there's good and there's bad. And I think the problem that we have in Kenya is that, number one, we're operating in a very uh, new, as, as um, Mark mentioned before, there doesn't seem to be much comprehension of what is happening online, which um, is leaving us with a, in a little bit of a vulnerable uh, position, especially when you think about what's happened, the revelations that we've heard in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, interesting. Um, Mark, um, your idea or, or, or your thoughts around the impact of uh, okay. the internet on democracy? I think democracy? we need to understand that there is uh, the long-term and short-term effects and the immediate, immediate effects of such like actions. And that means that, for example, the immediate effects would be to sway people. But when you talk about long-term effects, then probably we are looking at this data. Who else is having it? For example, you understand that in Kenya today, we have a lot of internet banking and people have connected their emails to, uh, to their banks and they can make such like transactions. Now, if my details that you fetched from uh, or that you mined from social media can also include some of those uh, important details like banking transactions, mm -hmm. like how to go about uh, uh, looking for my password and all that. Mm -hmm. That information is so crucial that its long-term effect is so grievous, especially if that data may land in, uh, in the wrong hand somewhere. Some, so anyone else can 
operate it or use it for any other activity in the country. And some of these things that you need to understand again is that the data, the company, the Cambridge Analytica company did not only operate solely as an independent uh, consultant for the yeah. Jubilee government. These people had networks in the country. They worked with the people. If you look you at... You don't think they... Well, I, you think they needed and worked with a local company? I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm almost sure that these people worked with local organizations. And they controlled information points. First of all, they created something known as joint data setting uh, op operations. And these joint data setting operations lead them to contacting important people, people like polling companies, mm. people like the Electoral Commission, people like uh, politicians, key figures, the bloggers and all that. Well, you're painting because a the quite idea, pervasive picture. Yeah, the, the idea was to control information depending on the psychological profiling that they had done on particular voters in the country. And therefore, they had to target those people individually with specific information. And by targeting them with that specific information, it, means, it meant that they have to reach them at all levels and okay. all-rounded contacts. And, and that's an interesting one of yeah. all levels and reaching them at all contacts. Because, yeah. Tom, we, we've had of the, the claim that they did two surveys of about 50,000 people. Now, your surveys and most of the other companies we know in the country typically survey 2,000 people. What would this information, if indeed it happened, how useful would that be uh, to someone like yourself? What would you do with data from 50,000 people twice over? Well, I would certainly like to have it. Um, it would be very interesting to look at, but especially starting with the questionnaire. Mm. Um, or maybe take a step back to find out how they selected respondents. Um, but let's assume that that claim that we saw in the clip is true, um, 50,000 or 47,000, two surveys. Um, first of all, as you were mentioning, when we do a national survey of 2,000, we come up for the country with a statistical error margin of plus or minus 2.2%. If we're talking about a national sample of around 47 or 50,000, for the country, that margin of error goes down to 0.45%. Now, that may not seem like much, 1.5% uh, on either side, but in a close election, um, that could make a difference. Um, also, you are, would be able, with such a, 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 a big sample, mm. to produce statistically useful data at the county level. And I would assume, um, though I don't have knowledge, but I would assume that that 50,000, 47, whatever it was, was apportioned by population. So there would have been probably four or 5,000 people interviewed in Nairobi with maybe 3 million, 2, 3 million registered voters and far fewer in, in sparsely populated counties like Lamu. But that also raises the question of whether, assuming the data was actually obtained, was it shared below the presidential campaign level to with Jubilee candidates, candidates for other county uh -huh. um, offices? I mean, that's just a question. But I just want to get back to this sort of general point Michael was making. I mean, this book uh, called The Victory Lab that was written about um, Barack Obama's use of data mining and so on and messaging in the 2008 campaign in particular um, goes through uh, just an incredible uh, number and variety of research experiments to try to find out um, what motivate people first to vote at all mm -hmm. or to get registered when they're 18 and then vote if they've been registered and then what determines choice and trying to identify those whose vote choice can be, vote choice can be determined or even changed through certain types of persuasion. Now there's nothing illegal about that. That's just smart use of data. As long as the data that's being used has not been obtained illegally okay. or under false uh, uh -huh. premises. Uh -huh. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, I just might say with regard to the uh, description of the activities in this book, um, one critical uh, ex set of experience, experiments that was done was to try to find out the best way of reaching people who could be, whose voting behavior could be changed. And they ended up um, 
putting adverts in uh, public transportation, subways mm -hmm. and buses in areas, in areas where, where voter turnout has traditionally been low. Okay. I mean, and right. that's just one example of it. Again, nothing illegal about that at all. Okay. It's about how you obtain the data that you then use. In and that. also one other okay. thing. Uh -huh. I mean, when we do a survey, when Ipsos does a survey in Kenya, we always at the end of that survey ask if people have a mobile phone uh, and if they do have one or somebody in the house does, if we can have that number, so in future, if we're doing a quick mobile phone you can do survey, survey, we can call them up. Okay. We guarantee these people that that information, including their phone number, is not going to be given to anybody else, and it is never given. All right. So it's about how you gather the data. So if, and that's the same finish, thing Mark is saying. Just to finish, yeah? if in that survey, if there was one of 50,000 or whatever it does, yeah. people took mobile phone numbers, and then these people were contacted either through a phone call or uh -huh. a media message through a third party, okay. that would be breaking the well, ethical well, boundary line. Well, but that is line. interesting because I do remember even personally receiving messages from you yeah. know, different campaigns saying vote for so-and-so, and I thought, well, where did they how did you get my number? Yeah, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but let's talk about the laws surrounding this. And Nanjala, uh, before we bring you in, let me read uh, this from uh, American. That's the American regulation. And I suppose for them, this is, is the bane of their discussion. Not about Joseph Kenya, please. Can we uh, get the right one uh, on the screen? This is about the American regulation. A foreign national shall not direct, dictate, control, or directly or indirectly participate in the decision-making process of any person, such as a corporation, labor organization, political committee, or political organization with regard to any election-related activities. That's why Trump might get impeached. And yes, yes. And, but this is the thing about um, if they're found to have broken this particular law. But Nanjala, what happens with our laws in Kenya? Are they sufficient um, to start to say that there was any illegal activity that took place with Cambridge Analytica? No. <laughs> um, um, so we do have privacy laws. And your right to privacy is definitely protected by the Constitution. Um, but there's a secondary layer of reg regulations and legislation that is required in order to prevent the kind of data leaks that you're talking about. Like when you get a text message from a political party from a listserv that you didn't sign up to, or you buy a phone from a certain mobile phone company and you find that you are registered for seven premium services that you don't remember registering for. That is basically the mobile phone operator sharing your phone number and your contact information with a third party vendor without checking in with you. And so far, there just hasn't been any urgency um, with regards to the government in terms of getting these laws passed. And data uh, advocates and, and you know IT specialists and privacy specialists have been advocating for these laws forever to sort of close this loophole that makes it possible for companies to pr prey basically on Kenya's private information. And I remember being extremely alarmed when we learned about the scandal with the e-citizen platform and the fact that the e-citizen platform contains private information for millions of Kenyans. If you are to get a new driver's license, if you want to get a register, buy or sell a car, if you want to register a business, you have to take all of your private information and put it on the e-citizen platform. For the Treasury to then turn around and say that they have no idea where the money is going, that's, or who's running the back end of the e-citizen platform, that's appalling. That is. You know, that's the height of irresponsible data management. But again, that's, you know, we, we also don't have a culture of responsible data management. You tweet at a company to say, you know, I'm having a problem X, Y, Z, and they respond to your tweet publicly with the physical location, your address, where you are, and, you know, that, is, that compromises the safety and privacy of the meat of the user. We don't have a culture of responsible data management, and underneath that, we also don't have the legal framework that makes this kind of predatory behavior um, I I illegal and not just unethical. All right, Nanjala. Can I just add one quick yes, thing? Yes, yes. It took, according to reports on the BBC, yeah. it took five days for the Information Commissioner's Office in, in England to get a warrant, to, get a warrant mm -hmm. to go and search Cambridge Analytica's London office. Yeah. And you wonder, were any records destroyed during that five-day period? And right. if they were, could they be... Could that be uh, discovered? And, and I think it'd be and, interesting and to see what, what information was on, comes out of that. Well, and a member of parliament was on air this morning, yeah. said, we need to change our law in the UK so that such a long delay is no longer necessary, right. even if rights to privacy have to be respected. But again, okay. we need to understand that yes, information can be deleted, 
but it cannot disappear. Mm -hmm. So it only takes smart people to get it. Yeah. Even like if you, you. delete it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it never really disappears. It or, will not disappear. you know, so data maybe the or the internet. Have no consequences um, getting the yes, so we'll, we'll never we'll forget. See. Nanjala, I want to ask you this. Do you think we should have a law that states that um, foreign nationals should not in any way be involved in whatever manner uh, in our elections? Um, perhaps uh, to mirror what the law says or the regulations say in America? Me personally or me as a researcher? Um, me personally, yes. I think the level of foreign interference in Kenyan elections is getting to absurd levels. Remember that the uh, Privacy International alleges that Jubilee paid $6 million, 600 million Kenya shillings just for this one company. They had a whole network of international PR companies that worked on their campaign. There was BTP Partners, there was Harris Media. And then Ju NASA also had its yes. you know, network of international consultants and et cetera. So how, what would this money have done if it had remained in the country? What difference would it have made if they had actually worked with local consultants who were very much tied to the realities, the local realities, and would have pushed them to run an issue-based campaign and not just a slick marketing campaign that really wasn't speaking to the issues that people were facing? I think that it's getting more and more difficult with the you know, globalization and with people, especially with what social media has done, is it's made it possible for us to have conversations across geographical boundaries um, that you know, it's going to be much more difficult to contain international influence on domestic policies. I mean, there, for all of that legal uh, spiel, there are definitely many non-American people who volunteered on political campaigns in the US, certainly with the Obama election. There were many uh, non-Americans who flew over to go and help because they were so inspired by that message. Um, but you know, having said that, I think that uh, there's so much money in Kenyan elections. We had the most expensive election ever in world history in 2017. And that always brings out the unsavory characters. That always brings out the rats. And what we had really in 2017 was a festival of rats. Mm. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Mark, you agree as we close now. Yes, I think it's also important for us to take these issues quite seriously. Yeah. Uh, I'm really saddened by the silence of our leaders. Mm. Uh, because, for example, no one is talking about this, especially in the political class. Yeah. You would think there'd be more noise about yeah, it, I yes? There would be a lot more noise about right. this. People would really, the, the parliamentary committees would be sitting down to really interrogate really what happened. Even in the spirit of the handshake between President yeah. Uru Kenyatta and Rai Lodi. Yeah. Really, it's time to get things right. It's time to really just narrow it down to what is right for our country. Okay. And that which is right, let's do it. All right, I want to ask yeah. you this final question as we close. Yeah. Uh, about data that's taken i mean i think there was one was was the link testoni.com yeah. or something on facebook yeah. tom is looking here strangely because he is not on the internet <laughs> at all and, and perhaps with the, with good reason knowing yeah. the revelations yeah. but you remember all those surveys yeah. about you know what would your trip to canon look yeah. like i don't yeah. know you know all these things yeah. just um in about a minute or so give people some tips now first of all uh all this big data management is driven from something known as i-dimensional data analytics. Mm. I-dimensional data analytics deals with profiling of data in terms of the demographics and the specific variables involved in that data analytics. In that reference, uh, a number of uh, tools can be developed to manage that depending on the intention and the objective of the specific people who are handling that. For example, if I want to manipulate electoral process depending on the data that I've gathered on a technology base, then I can develop an algorithm, that I, a high dimensional data analytics algorithm mm -hmm. that would correspond to that and that would manipulate data or living imagine between me and you are, as candidates mm -hmm. of 11% or whichever percent. Okay. These are things that are done within some of these laboratories. So, uh, and it scales down to simple social activities, uh -huh. including just simple links like you asking, uh, answering certain questions. Yeah. How would you look like in 30 years? I know. How, how would you look like as a man? I think. Yeah, how, how many would you children look like will as you have? It's crazy. You know, yeah. 
in a simplistic way, you may think probably these people are just looking for traffic or it's just fun. Yeah. But what you don't know is that you're giving somebody your data. You're giving them information. And so you're the telling way, them about you, your likes, yes. your dislikes, and your, technology your preferences. Technology can tell us much more about you yeah. than yourself. Wow. In fact, okay. they can profile you in terms of your decisions, where you go how you move. Right. Some of these links also are spywares, are spy links, mm -hmm. that they know which other site you visited. Okay. So for, for example, if you're operating in an organization like Standard, yeah. and you use Standard Network, a network that is based on Standard, and you click on that link, and there is a spyware on that link, so it will replicate up the itself okay. in the entire system, uh, and yes. fetch that data and send it somewhere very All right, far. Mark, I want us to conclude. A very quick, yes or no. Is yeah. this the beginning of the end of Facebook? I saw somebody saying that on Twitter? Not really, but okay. I think Facebook is bigger than uh, Mark Zuckerberg at the moment. Okay. I, I think That's... he really needs to really think about him really still standing so at the top. Leave like, um, okay. Not really to anyway, leave, but to get a lot more of support. Their net worth, yeah. uh, worth yeah. has declined by $5 billion uh, in the yeah. last week or so. I just wanted to, about the, the comment on uh, why isn't there more noise yeah. uh, in, in public uh, space at the moment. I mean, aside from you, uh, bringing the topic in here tonight. You know, it's, it's quite a while until the next, next election. Um, if you go through the European uh, Election Observer Mission Report, I think it's on page 41, 42, they do raise a number of serious issues about social media, fake news, and so on and so forth. So let's not be impatient. Um, I think it's a complicated subject. Mm. Uh, we need input from experts and others, um, as well as sort of from the sort of political uh, perspective. So just because there isn't a lot of, and, and many of the questions about Cambridge Analytica have yet to yes. be to be answered. Yeah. So I don't think there's a big hurry. And luckily there's four years until the next election. Okay. So let's hope that's one of the issues that will be All looked right. at um, with the sobriety uh, okay. that is required. Tom, thanks. Nanjala, if you're still with us, just a minute. Where do we go from here? Should we be making more noise? What's the next thing we should be pushing for? I mean, the election might be five years away or four years away, but if people are still gathering our data, they can do all sorts of things with it, given five years, surely. And I think that's where I disagree completely with Tom. I think there's an urgency here that people really need to get on. I happened to listen into the cybersecurity bill debates um, in Parliament last week, and their biggest concern was how to control bloggers who were saying bad things about politicians. That shows that there's a misguided sense of priority among the political class who don't realize what a vulnerability this has created. If a person, the, the final data set that um, is, has gotten Cambridge Analytica in trouble had 50 million people, information from 50 million people. There are only 48 million people in, that, in Kenya. So when you think about what is possible, I think there's a misguided sense of um, that we have time to block these loopholes. And in fact, we really need to start thinking seriously about how people's information is collected and managed. And on the political consulting side, on the people being able to poison political discourse in this country, I think a lot of people don't realize how much damage has been done to Kenya in the last five years. I, I, I personally, I can say anecdotally, the way the rhetoric has changed, the way we talk about each other, the way we dehumanize each other. Just think about how people reacted to stories of protesters and yeah. opposition supporters being dragged out of the house, you know, Samantha Pendo's death. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that having happened in Kenya even 10, 15 years ago? Right, yeah. Something has changed. The water has been poisoned. The rhetoric has become extremely dangerous. And I really do think there's an urgency about this that we really need, to, as people, as citizens who want this country to survive in one piece. Okay. We really need to take this seriously. Indeed, thank you. Nanjala Nyabola. You can find her on Twitter. Um, and she's the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet is Transforming Politics in Kenya. Thank you for your time. Marco Barr, who's a data scientist. Tom Wolf, who's a researcher. I need at to read Ipsos. her book. Um, yes, and you need to read her book as well. <laughs> Please, Please sell me do. a copy. <laughs> I will link you two up. I, I would you. do that.